Hi, I'm going to be presenting on primate rehabilitation release in Belize and how it's been used for very successful endangered species reintroduction. My name's Paul Walker. My wife and I have been living in Belize for 35 years, and we established Wild Tracks as a nonprofit conservation organization back in 1990. In December 2010, we established the National Primate Rehabilitation Center, working in partnership with the Forest Department of the Government of Belize. Using primate rehabilitation as a tool to reduce the illegal trade in primates here in Belize, and as a tool for rewilding. Belize has two species of primates, the endangered Yucatan black howler monkey and the Central American spider monkey, which is also endangered. Primate rehabilitation has seen, been seen primarily traditionally as an animal welfare issue, taking in sick, injured, orphaned animals, um, bringing them back to good health and trying to give them a new start in life, very much a welfare output. But it can have much broader, more far-reaching, long-term gains, conservation gains. Using animals that have been temporarily lost to the wild population, in Belize, we've been able to deliver very positive conservation outcomes, reinforcing the national and regional population, increasing species presence across its former range, and increasing the species resilience to disease, natural disasters, and climate change, together reducing the risk of national and global extinctions. How have we done this? By using wildlife rehabilitation as a strategy integrated into the wilder toolkit, wider toolkit of species conservation actions across the country, working within the legislation and policy system of Belize, alongside enforcement activities, public awareness activities, and of course, habitat protection. It required very strong partnerships with the National Wildlife Authority, in this case, the Belize Forest Department, and be, to be supported by the national legislation. It's required a good contextual awareness of the status of the species, the national distribution, the requirements of the species in terms of habitat, scale and scope of habitat, condition of habitat, the threats and sources of threats to the monkeys, their climate change resilience. We're working within changing ecosystems a broad understanding of the species ecology and behavior is essential, I think, for successful rehabilitation and release. It required a robust participatory conservation planning process to plan the route ahead, um, to engage with all players, all actors in the system, and also to facilitate capacity building at all levels. We've developed a planned structured process to guide the um, rehabilitation from rescue through to post-release. Most of the monkeys entering the rehabilitation center come in from the illegal wildlife trade, either confiscated by the forest department or surrendered directly by the owners. But we also take in um, rescued monkeys, monkeys that have been stranded by forest clearance and forest fragmentation, which is an increasing issue here in Belize, for translocation. All monkeys coming in um, to the facility go through a quarantine period, generally of a minimum of 30 days to enable us to screen for parasites, to treat the parasites, treat injuries and other ailments that um, we'll have, and also to start tackling the mental ailments that most traumatized baby monkeys from a pet trade suffer, to eventually be able to clear them from quarantine to go into rehabilitation proper. One of the early stages of rehabilitation is social integration. For monkeys coming in from the illegal wildlife trade, they've generally been kept as a surrogate dog on a chain in the backyard, or as a surrogate rabbit in a hutch in the backyard. They've been kept in isolation from other monkeys. They don't have monkey skills. They often don't even realize they are monkeys. So enabling them to gain the confidence to play with other monkeys, to learn monkey behavior, and to integrate into a group to then move forward in growth and development through rehabilitation, acquiring skills, wild skills as they go. We rely very heavily on pre-release enclosures for the skills acquisition. So we have areas of forest, half an acre to three quarters of an acre of forest each enclosure, fenced with electric fencing, um, in which the monkeys will spend the final three, six, 12 months or more um, 
of rehabilitation, learning climbing skills, so that by the time they're released, they actually have exceptional climbing skills that really you wouldn't know that they're not fully wild monkeys in terms of their climbing skills, but also developing spatial awareness of where the troop members are and the various other aspects of biology that have to be um, excellent for release. They've got to be cleared for health um, before release. It's essential that we only release animals that are healthy and free from parasites. The assessment of release site is in itself a huge task, release preparation. Um, looking at the status of protection of the release site, the condition and extent of the habitat, the food availability within the habitat, threats and risks um, to monkeys and to the habitat at the site, um, engaging with local communities, ensuring that they are fully supportive and in a position to be able to participate uh, as fully as possible. This really is a, a critical component of a successful release in our opinion. The actual release is preceded by a final pre-release health assessment um, conducted in this case in the picture by our vet, Dr. Philip DeShield from Animal Medical Center. Um, once they're cleared for release, they go into um, a supported soft release. We rely very heavily on making the release as easy as possible for the monkey. So we move them into a release enclosure where we keep them for a few days, providing the food and water there. Once we open up the enclosure, let the monkeys out into the forest, we continue provisioning them at the release site for as long as they want it. Now the monkeys generally come in for just a few days, just three, four, five days typically before they find enough food of their own to not be interested in the provision food we're providing. In the earlier days, before we did more fine tuning of our rehabilitation system, monkeys were dependent on our supplemental food for a much longer period. It was in the early days, often three or four weeks of providing supplemental food. But the fine tuning has meant the monkeys become wild a great deal faster than um, in the early days. Throughout this soft release, um, supported soft release, we're doing very intensive monitoring. So the monkeys are followed physically, visually through the forest from dawn to dusk um, through this entire period of soft release. Once the monkeys stop taking supplemental food, we consider this the first stage of actual release. Um, we'll continue monitoring them closely for another three months after this stage um, to ensure that we're positioned to see how the monkeys are faring, what their movements are like, what their feeding behaviors are like, what their activity budgets are like, what the troop cohesion is like, to ensure that we're in a position to make interventions if interventions are necessary. Mm -hmm. And they're few and far between, but occasionally a monkey will become separated from its family troop and we'll need to call it back to rejoin the troop. A simple intervention like that can make the difference between a successful release and a failure. After the first three months of dawn to dusk monitoring, we back off to some extent um, and then just have occasional visits to keep an eye on each of the troops that's been recently released to see how they're doing and assess that they're all there, that the behavior is good, whether any injuries or anything like that. So that will continue on an ongoing basis. We also conducted a post five year release um, assessment. So after the first five years of releases, we had a pretty extensive assessment of the monkeys. All the monkeys had been released, looking at their distribution, their troop dynamics. Um, there's been quite a lot of partner shifting in those first few years and really looking at what the long-term survival had been. And that was the study that actually first gave us the um, assessment of 95% year, 95 post-release survival through the first year. We're also now just starting a 10-year assessment. So after 10, actually 11, because of COVID, we had a, we skipped a year. We're now doing a post 10 year of assessment, uh, a post 10 year release assessment to really see the success, to gauge the success and look at the numbers and the area of occupancy of the established um, subpopulation. A brief look at numbers. So we've over the 11 years we've been in operation, 12 years actually almost now, um, we've received a total of 137 howler monkeys and 27 spider monkeys. So far more howler monkeys than spider monkeys. This is a reflection of the fact that spider monkeys are more threatened still in Belize than the howlers. They've been pushed back to much more remote places and have little contact with human communities. 
Um, of the howlers we've released to date, a total of 88. So 77 have been released in our primary release site, the Northeast Biological Corridor. We've also now started a second release site in the Runaway Creek Reserve in central Belize as a second um, reintroduction of the howlers. The spiders we've only recently started releasing, so we've released seven to date. Uh, we're still in the process. We have several more groups to go out over the next 18 to 24 months. Very few monkeys are assessed as being non-releasable. We're often asked what makes a monkey releasable versus non-releasable. In my opinion, in most instances, in the majority of instances, it's not so much whether a monkey is releasable or not, but whether or not you're prepared to put enough effort in and resources into enabling that monkey to develop to become releasable. We've had very few that have actually failed the final tests and are therefore assessed as being non-releasable. Some of the measures of success. Well, certainly one of the measures of the rehabilitation success has been the enormous decrease in illegal trade in pet monkeys in Belize. Working with the forest department, Wildtrax has been able to bring about a 95% reduction in the keeping of monkeys, which is illegal in Belize. Um, it's illegal to have any pet monkey um, in Belize. So a 95% reduction um, in the keeping of pet monkeys. Another figure which um, I think is a very strong demonstration of success is the fact that we have a 95% post-release survivorship of the howlers through their first year of life as wild monkeys in the forest, which is substantially higher than any other facility we're aware of in the region. And this is a reflection of the structured processes we've developed and implemented to ensure that monkeys are not only fit and healthy for release, but have also acquired the skills needed for life in the wild and are monitored extensively in the early stages of release to ensure that if things are going imperfectly, we're in a position to make a modest intervention if necessary. Another one is, another measure of success is the level of reproduction. So we've released 77 monkeys in the Northeast Corridor over the last 10, 11 years. That introduced population has now grown to an estimated 200 monkeys. So a very, very fast rate of population growth, reflecting the unlimited scale of forest almost um, at the release site from which howl monkeys were extirpated 80 years or more ago. Abundant food resources, the population is bouncing back very, very fast. We've had first and second generation wild born young to the monkeys that we've rehabilitated and released. Again, another measure that they really are wild monkeys, um, fully returned to the wild population, fully productive as wild monkeys in the ecosystem. And as it says down here, we've released another 10 howlers and another further one this year in the Runaway Creek um, Reserve in Central Belize as our second release site. It all requires partnerships. None of this could happen without um, working with other organizations. It's a, it's a big team effort. So without the Forest Department of Belize, we couldn't do any of what we do. As the authority, it mandates us to do what we do, um, supports our activities in any way it can. We also get very strong support from Belize's NGO community across the country. So they are the eyes and ears looking out for monkey issues, be they illegal pets or stranded animals, injured animals in need of support anywhere in the country. The vets. So here we have on the left, we have um, a Twycross vet um, actually training our vet, our Belizean vet, uh, Philip De Shield, in how to conduct um, in pre release health assessments to meet international standards. So that now Philip is the one doing these ongoing health assessments on our behalf. So veterinary support is critical both from our the regular vets in country and also from some of the vets who pro bono provide guidance when we have more complex issues that need broader um, input. We also rely on wildlife champions who may be individuals across the country concerned about wildlife and do what they can to um, help address issues, support activities, maybe sending supplies or even helping send um, an injured monkey for help. Local community. So this is referring to the community around the Wildlife Rehabilitation Centre here and also the other community near the um, release 
sites. It's absolutely essential in our opinion to have good local community support and engagement. Um, and this is coming through again and again in many conservation projects is the realization that community support is of paramount importance, um, really very central need. So as I say, it's a team effort. It's not just Wildtracks working alone. It's Wildtracks working in close partnership with the Forest Department of Belize with great support from Twycross Zoo, from Houston Zoo, Burger Zoo in the Netherlands. So zoos play a pretty important part in what we're actually doing here. Animal Medical Center, the um, veterinary practice in Belize City that is our primary um, go-to for veterinary support. Again, Philip here doing a release um, health assessment on a spider monkey. The Belize Conservation NGO community in the Belize Zoo, again, more eyes and ears um, across the country, providing whatever support they can whenever we need it. The protect area managers um, at the release sites, again, essential to have their support, cooperation, goodwill, and participation. We also rely heavily on donors and benefactors. Um, the program is run on a tight shoestring. We're very, very cost effective, but it still requires funds. So a huge thank you to the donors and benefactors who make this possible. And of course, last but by no means least, the Wildtrack staff, volunteer team and researchers who do the activities day by day who make all this work. So a huge thank you to everyone concerned. <laughs>